Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Victoria Lynn. I'm the director of the Tarawari Museum of Art, and it's a real pleasure to see you here this afternoon in this very cool environment. Um, we're here, of course, in the midst of the wonderful paintings of Geoffrey Smart, an exhibition that has come to us from the Samstag Museum of Art um, and has been supported by uh, Arts Victoria, Wakefield Press, the University of South Australia, um, the RACV Club, Paoli Smith, and of course the Beeson Family Foundation, who are our principal sponsor. Um, we're very uh, honoured to have a lecture today by Leon van Skyk. Leon is um, Professor of Architecture at RMIT, where he holds an innovation chair in practice-based research in design. From his base in Melbourne, he has promoted local and international architectural culture through design practice-based research. In 2005, at the 75th Anniversary Awards of the RAIA, he was awarded the inaugural Neville Quarry Prize for Architectural Education. In 2006, he was made an Officer AO in the General Division of the Order of Australia for service to architecture as an academic, a practitioner and an educator. And of course, to the community through involvement with a wide range of boards and organisations related to architecture, culture and the arts. He's written widely on architecture, many, many volumes, um, including Mastering Architecture, Design, City Melbourne and Spatial Intelligence. He's written on Denticorka Marshall, Non-Fictional Narratives. He's written uh, Procuring Innovative Architecture with Geoffrey London and Beth George. And Meaning in Space, Housing the Visual Arts or Architectures for Private Collections. I think Leon's going to give us um, a very unique and enlightening perspective um, from very much his own point of view on the work of Geoffrey Smart. And I'd please um, ask you now to join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I don't know what it is about introductions. One never recognizes oneself in them at all. And as, as Victoria said, this is a personal, largely architectural speculation that I'm going to make this afternoon. So I do have a slight background in art. I studied art under Richard Hamilton for a year. And uh, I have a perennial fascination with it. But when Victoria wondered whether I would be able to talk about this exhibition, I jumped at it because there were certain things that seemed to me to be going on in these paintings which are central to many of the ways in which we think about what's happening to our cities. And I, I started on that. It was a fairly simple idea and I'm going to take you through it in some, some detail. But as I've gone along, more and more things have cropped up. And only a couple of days ago, I was with Peter Elliott, the architect. Now, some of you may have come here on the M80, on the new section of that to the west, has a number of very big metal sound walls. Those were designed by Peter Elliott. And in complete contrast to my thesis, he was inspired directly by Jeffrey Smart. And he showed me on his mobile phone an image exactly like that painting in the corner. And you'll see many of those yellow, crinkly walls in what he's done. So <clears throat> there are architects who are directly influenced by Jeffrey Smart's vision. And he's having, in that way, perhaps completely unbeknownst to him, a direct impact on how certain parts of our city get designed. But what I'm really interested in here is the notion of terrain vague. Now, terrain vague is a term coined by Ignazi Sola Morales, the great Barcelona theoretician, now, alas, deceased, 
But it came about because he and others were perplexed by the fact that the spaces in European cities that people enjoyed most appeared almost always to be spaces that hadn't been designed. Uh, this is a really pretty awful thing for somebody in the design community to realize. And he started grappling with what it was that these spaces shared so that we as architects and urbanists and landscape architects could perhaps begin to understand how these undesigned spaces capture the popular imagination. Nikos Papastiadis, who's here tonight, has also thought about these spaces, and he calls them parafunctional, beyond the functional, perhaps. I'm not sure that that's what it is, but there is something about them that enables people to invest them with their own ideas about what is going on in a city. I'll just see if I've got this right. So when Jeffrey Smart makes a painting like this one, I'll have to say again by way of introduction that I haven't met him. I did read his biography. And as I've been making this talk, more and more people who have met him have come along and said to me, well, you've got to put this in and you've got to put that in, and some of that is in here. When he makes a painting like this, and if you leave here this evening, there's a little sketch on the left-hand side on the wall facing the arrival desk where he writes a little bit about what he might be seeing. So he's fascinated by the plain, the green plain, and the various signs and things that are in front of it. That's probably the real subject. But then suddenly we see a figure dashing past. The figure mentioned in the sketch outside the gallery is one which is somewhat more charged, perhaps, in terms of its visual imagery. Charged in a way that I think we need to understand if we're going to really understand what's going on in these paintings. I always approach a topic by building up a series of ideograms. And to me, this is a key, a key one when thinking about what we're seeing in these paintings. We very often confront a person in the paintings, like that running girl who appears to be the subject. And that person is very often looking looking at something, something else. What we're not shown is any depiction of the artist himself looking. And in fact, all of the looking that he does is displaced. We're never invited to see things directly through his eyes. I think when you look at this picture, again, where is, is the main focus? We're looking at two ranks of changing rooms, and the real focus, in a way, is that set of, set of that space beyond, which is delineated by four poles, one green, one blue, one red, one yellow. And yet in looking at that, we can't help but notice that the artist is noticing something else, an erotically charged image in the changing rooms. But he's not presenting that to us full frontal, so to speak. It's off to one side. And it reminds me of the work of Ed Burra, Edward Burra, who was fascinated by sailors and painted, painted them often, but, but again at a remove, 
were not here in the room with the painter and the sailors. He has very carefully made it evident to us that he's looking at them through a frame, that they are somewhat removed. I'm dwelling on this because Jeffrey Smart comes from a generation <clears throat> where, as did Burrow, where this kind of desire and this kind of interest could not be frankly expressed. Some artists from that period did, in a way, frankly express it, but not, I think, in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that would appeal to Jeffrey Smart at all. If you look at Paul Cadmus's work, you see a whole series of really quite obvious icons and, and, and images. And we are invited, as we look at that, to see it as if through the artist's eyes. And the artist is seeing certain things that most of the other people in the picture are not. And he's basically, with a nod and a wink, saying to his friends, look at this. I found it quite, quite curious, too, that as David Hickey, the American critic and theorist, writes, the erotic and aesthetic potentials of images derive from the same rhetorical language and iconic display. And beyond the proclivity of the beholder, there is no way to sort them out. Again, we have a deadpan picture, changing rooms, and two figures. That rush cutter's bay. Hmm. Oh, no, sorry. Is as close as, as as Jeffrey Smart ever gets to actually, frankly, looking straight into the picture plane and showing us what he's looking at. This is much more typical. There's a displacement going on here. We we have acres of deck. We have a figure. We have some landscape. There are certain things being signaled to us in that landscape. And these align with the work of people like Ed Rouché, who was fascinated with the pop popular imagery, imagery in the environment, which so much preoccupies Jeffrey Smart, but in a much less direct way. Jeffrey Smart picks it up, but it's in, in the background. What he's really focusing on seems to me to be the figure of the young swimmer looking out into that space. And once again, we are invited to look into that space, see the deck, see the shed, see the advertising slogan, and then almost incidentally, to one side in a displaced way, we see this figure. Now, this is almost a classic piece of terrain vague. As here, anyone looking into it, whatever their proclivity, as Dave Hickey would have it, can dwell on it and make it into something that, that, that is their own. But this is a quasi-industrial space hasn't really been designed as such. I think this picture the Carhill Expressway of 1962 and most of these pictures so far are from that period gives us the clearest indication of where he situates himself. When he's completely removed, we, we have the little figure in the, to the right. 
is to your right as well. And all of the emotional focus is invested in that figure. It's as if the artist has created a homunculus and locates that in this space, a space where the traditional urban fabric is being completely undermined by the emergence of the new motorized city, new orders of urban organization. And we see in the background just jumbled up, higgledy-piggledy new office buildings, which don't in any way seem to relate to a continuous ground pain. We can only guess at the fact that in the background there may be streets, terraces, squares, and circuses. And these uncanny juxtapositions that catch Smart's eye are regarded quite rightly as alienating. And it's not only painters who notice this sort of thing, of course. Goddard's film Alphaville is all about the emergence of this new kind of cityscape. And many, many scholars in my field are completely overwhelmed by what's happening in Asian cities because of the explosive growth that's taking place there. And you get an attempt to understand the urban order that's emerging, not as something exotic, but as something which makes sense and can make sense for the communities who inhabit it. So I think I found that the review of these paintings by Nelson in The Age was very very unkind and somewhat missed the point entirely. It seems to me that here is an artist who, like Ed Ruscha, who spent all that time looking at Los Angeles and seeing things there and documenting them and cataloging them, to make us realize that cities develop new kinds of beauty through time. And when we get these new kinds of beauties into our mental framework and can see them, then we see the city in a very different way. It's not that Geoffrey Smart's not a very good painter and can only paint planes. It's because he has actually found a really profound subject matter and a subject matter which his own personal circumstances make him pioneer in seeing. I just think this wonderful painting that's in this room with us, he's basically saying, look, I can look at the landscape, I can deal with the landscape, but that's not really what we need to be looking at. We need to be understanding these movements through our cities, these stark and new things that are moving through our cities. In the paintings as you go around, there are all sorts of utilitarian, barely designed structures. He's picked those up too. They're almost all engineer designed. They've been the result of some very simple parameters. Few of them have been beautified. Few of them have an aesthetic intent. Even here where he picks up on highly figured forms, not just the flat planes that he was accused of, he's picking up on utilitarian installations dropped from a traditional urbanist's point of view randomly into space. Of course, they all have their own logic. But that logic is not one which has been controlled by a single individual. 
one of the problems with most newly designed spaces is that they require us to enter into the mind and the mental space of a single designer, or if we're lucky, into a team of designers. Whereas with these spaces that Jeffrey Smart was attracted to, that's not an issue. There isn't a mind, there isn't an imagination, there isn't some kind of perfected world suggested beyond them that is simply the fact that they exist. Many of them are surveillance towers or control towers. And in fact, another way of looking at the things that Jeffrey Smart is picking up on is to see that he's fascinated by the way in which these new spaces that we inhabit, that we all drive through, are controlled, how they're actually policed. I could have shown an image here of what a village looked like before there were curbs, before there were painted lines, before there was any clear demarcation between road and verge. And there are many such images to be had from the early years of photography. But today we live in a world where the space has been completely policed and controlled. There are some who think that this has gone so far that it has become a danger to us because we no longer take responsibility for being in space in an alert and responsible way. But it's interesting too that Jeffrey Smart's not just interested in this policing, he's also interested in how it's looked after. And he recognizes that what we've instituted in these peripheries of our cities is a massive set of regimes of care, a new kind of way of looking after, after the city. And again, he's not alone in that, although he's very early in that. There are architects like Lyons Architects who have made numbers of buildings which play with that language of the urban periphery. We'll just come back to the way in which I see Jeffrey Smart look, looking at things. There is a painting just at the back of the room with the dome popping up over a wheat field and a big striped pole in the foreground. It's almost there as if the dome stands for the traditional city and the pole in the foreground stands for a surveyor's pole that a new road is emerging that's going to sweep us past and we get a glimpse of of the traditional city in the background. But there's something else going on too, as in, in this one, the listeners, 1965, and you see here another wheat field and beyond a big listening device, a radar, or a, and lying on the field, a young man and it's almost as if the appeal, the erotic appeal to Jeffrey Smart is something that the young man has noticed and at the moment he notices it, he looks over his shoulders and sees the listener in the background. And this tension comes up about the possibility of being able to engage in that kind of erotic gaze without getting into trouble. I find this another fascinating example of where Jeffrey Smart is looking at things from. Obviously he must have taken a picture or a sketch from his seat in an aeroplane. And as you know, if you look out of the windows of an aeroplane, 
People outside can't really work out where you are. But this mechanic standing on the tarmac, surrounded by those controlling signs that fascinate smart so much, is looking directly back at the painter. And this is a phenomenon which was documented by the scientist Rupert Sheldrake, who actually wrote a book called The Sense of Being Stared At. So the whole business of looking and gazing is something which is with us the whole time. And that kind of look, which quite often referred to as the male gaze, which dissects and looks at the erotic potential of a figure, is something that can be felt. And this man turns around and stares directly at the window from which he feels that that stare is coming. Terrain Varg quite often has that kind of character to it. These are very often parts of cities which are industrial ruins or they've been fenced off and left over by roadworks. And there are unusual encounters. People suddenly see people in ways that they don't normally expect to see them when walking down a street or entering a square. I think this picture from 1968 to 69, approach to a city, is an extraordinary telling one. I mean, the first thing that we perhaps begin to notice is that there's a couple desperately trying to negotiate this really fairly appalling prospect. Where are they trying to walk to up that emergency verge? Are they trying to get to? those domino-like buildings in the background. But as I thought about this, I began to think, well, yes, this probably is one of the defining characteristics of terrain Vargas. Certainly what lies over the edge below will be a terrain Vargas, an undesigned leftover space. But there's something else that's going on here. And that fascination with the trucks and with movement that permeates these paintings. More and more of the ways in which we understand urban space, they're more and more to do with how we move through it. Of course, many writers have observed the differences that occurred when the railways were introduced and how one began to see cities and spaces in a really very different way. And I'm old enough to know that my grandfather, when he first drove his car at above 30 miles an hour, believed that this was a fairly dangerous thing to do because there was some belief in scientific cir circles that the body disintegrated at above 60 miles an hour. So we've entered a very different world and our cities are dramatically changing as a consequence. And I think in every one of the pictures that you look at in here, there's some hint of the fact that we're never actually in a place. We're always moving through them. And perhaps one of the biggest problems that we have as designers of places is that we always imagine that the audience is going to be in that place and will stay in that place and will be somehow trapped in it without fully understanding what this moving that we all do all the time is about. We go back to Edward Burrow again. And here's a, an erotically charged painting from looking at a railway tunnel and, and at a a hollow in a landscape which has some suggestions of a penetrable space. He 
picks up on the same thing. Here in the Red Warehouse in 2003, I wonder whether the real subject, certainly we have there the sign in the background, we have drums stacked up, we have a post in the foreground, we have waste ground, we have a, a truck moving off, a blue truck, we have a stranded motorless container and two people talking in front of it. The whole thing is impregnated with the idea of movement, that, that we're going to move from that point to some other point. I find it fascinating that in The Traveller, 1973, Smart gets to the point of being meticulously interested in the reflections, in the shiny sides of buses. By now, <clears throat> he's in Italy. In some ways, he is now a double exile. One of the reasons I think that these paintings have such power is that he is, in a sense, an exile in his own culture because of the way in which our society was then configured, and it meant that his greatest desires, his friendships, <clears throat> and his loves were all things that had to be, in some small or large way, concealed. There's a wonderful piece of writing by Paul Carter called A Christmas in Brunswick, in which he describes how for the migrant, everything is surface. Everything is reduced to a surface because nothing has a history. No place, no intersection is something that for the migrant speaks of things that happened there to a previous generation, to other members of a family. Everything is flattened. When we look at this fascination with movement and this beautiful depiction of it, it reminds me of the work of Andrew Holmes, who has spent an entire career making crayon drawings of prime movers a similar fascination for the way in which stuff is moved around the world, but not similar, because what Jeffrey Smart is actually painting is a man who's looking at a reflection in a bus, and we can't tell from where we're standing what he sees in that reflection. We can see, obviously, that he is reflected there, but we know that he would not be seeing that. Is he perhaps seeing the painter? I'm not sure. So you get the fact that everything in these spaces is about that displaced gaze, about being displaced, about the displacement of place and space, and the way in which we as a consequence can invade that space with our own musings, our own reveries. It's about this stage that I'd got to in thinking about this talk when I had a coffee with Corbett Lyon, who said, I'm not sure whether he's here, he said he, he had booked to come, but he might not be able to make it. And then he said to me, you do know that Geoffrey Smart was a great friend of Guildford Bell and that they used to, I think, I think Corbett said, I think they used to have lunch together. And one of the things that I've done in the past decades is to produce an extremely beautiful monograph in collaboration with a number of people on the works of Guildford Bell. Guilford Bell 
an architect, comes from, in some ways, the same difficult situation that Geoffrey Smart found himself in. A gay man at a time when such things were not openly discussed. An architect who, in so many of his houses, designed the bedrooms in such a way that people could go into bedrooms and decide afterwards whether they were going to have any kind of intimate connection with somebody in the next bedroom without anybody outside knowing it. So there's a whole elaborate layering in the plans that Guilford Bell got involved in, which were to do with this somewhat disappearing world of defiant desire. But I looked quickly then at Guilford Bell's last house, the Grant House at Officer, which was done in 1986, and I found it quite a startling experience. We go back to these changing rooms and you look at what pops up on the side of the, the house at Officer the entrance side. I can't, I can't believe that this is purely accidental. And then I saw another thing. And again, you look at the house at Officer and there's this very curious way in which the outside space facing down to the lake has these rows of chairs placed against the back wall, as if there's a single line of people looking out at something. And then I thought, there are these chairs in the painting, the gymnasium, which is on one of the posters for this exhibition. And while I can see that, and I can go back and say, goodness, what's going on here? Is this part of that same consequence of that way of looking at things? When in that painting, and here we list all of those marvelous sponsors who've made this possible and have made it possible for me to speak to you tonight. Thank you. But look, and here again, one of what Jeffrey Smart being a little, bit, a little bit more direct, perhaps, about what interests him in this, in, this, in this space, with its controlling lines. Even in the gymnasium, all of those fascinations are evident. So this is how I came to see him and, and, and still see him. I see him as an artist with an enormously sophisticated understanding of the elements of the emerging city and that arising probably because of the way in which he'd had to develop throughout his life this way of looking at things from a displaced position so that he couldn't be directly accused of looking at them in the way in which somebody like the painter Paul Cadmus, who I showed earlier on, blatantly did. And then he always creates, it seems to me, a figure who, it could be him, it could be us, it, it's some, somebody for whom he has some feeling, I think, some sympathy, some empathy. Like, how did you get yourself into this situation? And then he begins to be a little bit more frank sorry, about what that person is looking at. And it's as if at that remove you can actually begin to allow all of the parts of the scene to play out. And I see that perhaps is 
the most moving part of the message that, yes, aging, he, Ibn Homunculus, stands in this conflicted but beautiful new city and in spaces, all of which are terrain vague, spaces which we can appropriate as we see fit, spaces that are undesigned, where we don't have to grapple with the intentions and the concerns of a high-minded designer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leon. And if we could just have the lights up a bit, um, I'm sure there'll be a few questions for you, and we've got time for questions. Um, it was fascinating just to hear in the opening that uh, Peter Elliott's uh, sound walls have been inspired by Smart. That's just, <laughs> it's terrific because, of course, Jeffrey Smart composes his images, taking photographs of um, uh, images from Tehran Varg uh, in his midst, and, and now those images are going back into the landscape. But we heard about Tehran Varg, we heard about the idea of undesigned spaces, and um, through Leon's comparisons with other artists, we could see the very refined way in which Jeffrey Smart uses um, what Leon's described as the male gaze, um, tantalising us to look, but not necessarily looking directly. And um, those marvellous utilitarian installations that sometimes feel as though they've just dropped in from the sky above into the paintings. Um, and these are paintings that he's suggested to us that look at the changes in the urban landscape and a fascination with mobility, the ways in which we move through cities as if not to ever stand still. Um, and of course the migrant's perspective, um, where everything is seen as a kind of surface, a displacement, a displaced gaze and the idea of being displaced. And the comparison with Guilford Bell was just really um, a revelation. I've never heard that before, and it's uh, really fascinating to see some of those uh, images of that last house of Bell. So over to you now. I'd like to see if anyone's got a comment or a question. Nikos. <laughs> Thank you, Leon. That was an extremely delicate and incisive lecture. And I was really struck by the way in which you used that dialectic of um, control and responsibility through the um, terms of, of um, terrain bar and, and I agree entirely with the way in which you situated the paintings in that conceptual frame. However, um, I want to ask you a question about a word that you never used, a word that we might not even associate with. Um, Jeffrey Smart's painting, which is the word freedom. You said that terrain bar, in a sense, sends up the oppositional point. The area of controlled space and the area of um, the masterminded development of regulated flow of movement on the one hand, and its counterpoint, whereby we have a broken, exhausted sense of functionality or a or ignored sense of functionality in space, which opens up possibilities for alternative uses. And when you showed us the painting by Kuji of Kuji Beach, what caught my eye was the one section of the handrail which was missing. And that suggested, again, that dialectic between controlled and no longer controlled space. And through that gap, one could imagine the possibilities of alternatives to emerge. <coughs> And so I started to think about the characterizations that you suggested that would take us out of that negative notion of terrain Varg into the more positive notion. And you used the terms a kind of um, attentive form of movement rather than regulated form of movement. And then through Rupert Sheldrake's reference, I got the sense that you're also talking about the capacity to enter space where one sees invisible signs, one senses signs which otherwise aren't being sensed. 
And then I thought, if we combine those two characterizations, attentive movement and the sense of sensing invisible signs, is that the kind of glimpse that one might get of a sense of freedom that comes from these spaces? Goodness, Nikos. Um, <laughs> freedom is a... I mean, freedom is a very, a very big, big word to use in, in, in this context. And um, while I understand, did you say attempted movement? Attentive. Attentive. Oh, oh, aware, aware movement, attentive movement, acute and aware. Yeah. The. I don't know whether, whether, whether I can really go as far as to see there being freedom in, in, in this, but what does seem to, to happen with these and, and what Jeffrey Smart picked up and what you and your writings have picked up and I think what Ignacio Sola Morales picked up was that we enter into spaces where there are rules, but they seem to have been broken a bit. They've been disturbed. They, um, they've been disturbed, as you, as you say, by, by the passage of time. They've been disturbed by change of use. They've been, some of them are just remnant and leftover rules, if you like. And in, in a way, that seems to mean that we enter them and feel that we can actually make our own rules. And, and if that is freedom, then maybe it is. Whereas in, in some of the, the, mo the more beautifully designed spaces, we're always conscious that there are intended rules, um, intended behaviors, which with the best will in the world, a, a landscape architect or an architect can't avoid. I mean, you, you, you try and make it beautiful. And in doing that, you suggest all sorts of rules for, for how you should behave. And I think that the, the, the broken rules that, are, that lie behind these things, I mean, maybe, the, maybe another way of interpreting that picture where the, the people are cleaning the big signs is, is, is this endless attempt to actually try and refresh and, and bring back to the foreground the rules which are constantly being dirtied, defaced, and, and disappeared. But, uh, that's my response to, you, to your response, anyway. Okay. I think there was, is there another question? Yes. Do you mind yeah. um, just waiting for the microphone? Thank you. Would you like to stand up? Thanks. Thank you very much for addressing your talk. My name is Margaret. My question is about the works um, which include obvious portraits. All your comments have focused on um, human figures which are presented to us as anonymous or unnamed characters. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the named characters, um, including, for example, the self-portrait, which we see in this gallery here, but perhaps also many people will be familiar with the portrait of Clark James. Um, you know, what's going on there in relation to Tim and Mark? I thought the self-portrait was almost a, a manifesto of the terrain vague, because he stands there in front of fragments of posters and peeling bits and pieces and falling plaster and, and all the rest of it. It did, when I, when I was thinking about that painting, it did remind me very much again of um, Paul Carter's notion, the Christmas in Brunswick and everything becoming surface. I mean, here he is in a new country to him and he's standing against a flat plain, but that flat plain is peeling and revealing layer after layer of stuff behind it, which suggests that dense history that anyone who'd been there for a long time would have. But he presents himself in front of that, and he presents himself in front of that coldly. And it's almost as if to say, look, I know what's going on here, but here I am pinned to this plane. I think the, the, uh, the Clive James one, somebody said to me, when I was standing here a bit earlier, that Clive James had, had been really annoyed that he 
was so such a small figure in that big picture. <laughs> but to me, again, it seemed to be a, a painting which was profoundly empathetic. I mean, here, here is a figure who strides the media stage and has done for such a long time, and yet won't be with us forever. I mean, none of us are going to be here forever, and, and ultimately, he will be a dot in the memory of, of some of us and, and will be located in this remorseless, churning engine of the city. And he has, for a moment, come to rest in that place. And if he has the wit to look out over what he's seeing, he might see something very beautiful in that terrain vague. Do we have another question? Yes. Thanks. My name is Jan. In the same way that uh, books for an that seen with a piece of fine mirror can work as much more erotic as an entire thing is Perhaps the planes that to paint because they were easy. Perhaps planes are attractive because they're very easy to hide things behind. I keep looking at this particular landscape here and imagining, imagining Jeffrey Smart standing in it with his sexuality that you felt uncomfortable about, thinking, where can I hide it? And then suddenly seeing all these planes coming through the landscape, ah, oh, that's something that I can hide behind. Do you think that Jeffrey Smart is perhaps uh, a, uh, an opera that he's wanting to hide? Yeah, I think I think that's <clears throat> fairly explicit in what I've been been saying. In that um, the gaze is always displaced, and that and it's always to one side. It's it's always looking at both the object of desire, but also spaces beyond spaces spaces that are, that are hidden. So th there, is th there is that. I, I find it a little bit difficult to talk about this completely openly because that I'm not sure to what extent these kinds of atmospheres are still present with us. I know for the young generation, many of these kind of struggles that people of Jeffrey Smart's generation had and my own as well seem very alien. I mean, they, they probably wouldn't understand the kinds of things that are going on in some of these pictures at all, where there, where there is that, that erotic charge and, and also the thought of, well, what do we do about this because there's nowhere to go? And I mean, I think that's probably what propels Smart, at one level at any rate, into an understanding of the possibilities of terrain vague. But yep, the planes are the, the planes stand for so many different things in these paintings. For movement and surface and actually I mean well just their sheer beauty too. But as Dave Hickey once that book that I was quoting from David Hickey, The Invisible Dragon, was all about how he was dozing on a panel in Los Angeles and somebody asked him what was the next important thing in art and he just, he woke up and said beauty. <laughs> and then had to write a book about it, but anyway. <laughs> okay, well on that note, um, please join me in thanking Leon for a really brilliant lecture. Thank you. Thank you.